Okay, as our audience begin to filter in, uh, why not get started? Let's make the most of the eager beavers who were first to arrive. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this week's edition of the Thursday Talk webinars on DME for Peace. My name is Jack Farrell. I am the Manager for Partnerships and Strategic Innovation at Search for Common Ground. And I'm gonna be your host today. And despite hosting these webinars for over five years, I think this is the first time I've hosted one in a number of months. So I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Dudi Peles, uh, who is the co-founder of Games for Peace. And Dudi has joined us to lead a discussion on using video games to build peace. So just a note, if you have a question during today's presentation, you can write it on the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will address it once we reach the Q&A. I'm now going to hand over to today's guest. Judy, you are very welcome to the Thursday Talks. Feel free to take it away when you're ready. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Judy Peles. I'll introduce myself and we'll just start. So um, I'm an Israeli entrepreneur and educator. Uh, I usually talk about uh, innovation, education, and mostly video games. I teach about video games in two colleges in Israel, uh, and I'm, I'm also a founder of a technology a business incubator for startups. Uh, for, from my, um, I also co-founded two uh, game-related NGOs. One is, is a, an NGO called Game Is, who promoted the game industry in Israel, and the second one, which I'll talk about today mostly, is, is an NGO called Games for Peace, uh, which I currently am the chairman of. Uh, and Basically, I'm sharing the story of, of this NGO with you uh, today. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's just start. Um, about seven years ago, uh, I got a call from a guy I didn't know knew a, gold, a guy called Uri Michel. He was also an high tech entrepreneur. entrepreneur um, and he introduced me with the idea that you can take video games. Uh, which is something kids all around the world love and, and use in a daily basis and, and can turn it, uh, it into something that can promote dialogue. Uh, specifically, he wanted to promote dialogues between uh, Jewish and Arab kids in Israel. And uh, what he said to me is basically, uh, when we met, he was about around 30, I think, a bit more. Uh, he said to me, the first time I had a real conversation uh, with an Arab in Israel, uh, was in the army you know, when I was about 20. And, and I, I looked at what, when I had a real conversation with an Arab in Israel, and, and I, I saw the same thing. The first time I, I had a real conversation with an Arab, Israeli Arab was when I was 20. And it's, it doesn't make sense, uh, uh, but, but it's a bit logical because in Israel, there are separate uh, educational systems for Arabs and Jews because they speak different languages. They, we, we do, the kids do not interact a lot and it's 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 something that's that's not good eventually because it it, it increases the prejudice and and the uh, and the, the future problems that happens between uh, Jewish and Arabs. Uh, so so Uri presented this idea and his idea wasn't just that kids can play with each other in virtual worlds, but that that the interaction in the virtual worlds in the virtual worlds can eventually have an effect on real life and real friendships can start at the video game, but eventually can uh, become something uh, meaningful in the real world. Uh, I said, I'm in, basically. Uh, if it's, uh, at, at, this, at that time, I, I was kind of a, an expert in video games, specifically in, in video games and education. And uh, I really loved the cause. He seems like a, a good guy. Uh, another Arab guy joined us, a guy called Hans. And uh, we founded together uh, an NGO that we called Games for Peace. Uh, the first thing uh, we needed to do was basically decide on a game. Uh, the, our, our, thesis, our, our thesis was that if we find positive multiplayer games that uh, eventually will create positive interactions between people, uh, they'll see that they're not so different from each other. They both enjoy the same thing. And, and, and eventually they can, can interact in the virtual world and, 
and, and hopefully become friends. Uh, so the first game we chose was a game called Minecraft. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you know it or not. Uh, that's why I, I want to show a very short video of what's Minecraft. Let's go to a place where everything is made of blocks. Where the only limit is your imagination. Let's go wherever you want to go. Climb the tallest mountains. Venture down to the darkest caves. Build anything you want. Day or night. Rain or shine. Because this is the most significant sandbox you'll ever set foot in. Build a majestic castle. Invent a new machine. Or take a ride on a roller coaster. Play with friends. Build your own little community. Protect yourself with the strongest armor that you can craft. Fight off the dangers of the night. No one can tell you what you can or cannot do. With no rules to follow. This adventure, it's up to you. Oh, sorry. Uh... So, so basically, Minecraft was a game that was already around for a year or two in 2013. And, and for us, it was an obvious choice. It was a game about building. It's a game that hundreds of people can play together at the same time. If you, you can basically imagine it as a, as a massive multiplayer Lego um, a world that can, you can't just build things, but you can really interact and really create adventures in it. Um, and, and another advantage that even then in 2013, Minecraft was used in schools and, and was very popular uh, as an educational tool. Um, eventually, by the way, in September, uh, a year after, Microsoft bought the company that um, uh, developed Minecraft for an astounding amount of $2.5 billion. And uh, a few years later, they released Minecraft Education that's today part of Office. And most uh, uh, schools that use Office have licenses in Minecraft and are using Minecraft for education or can use Minecraft for education. On, uh, uh, for education. Um, so our first attempt uh, to organize something uh, to create this interaction was something we called the Play for Peace Weekends. Basically, we started marketing uh, all over the, the, the Middle East uh, that we're having a weekend that everybody can come to a virtual world and play together. And we, we had a, an amazing weekend with hundreds of players from all over the Middle East, uh, from from Egypt, Palestine, Israel, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, I think like 10 or 12 different countries. Uh, and everybody was were playing and building stuff like, like these things that you see here. Um, but eventually, uh, we understood that those weekends that we are organizing is, is basically preaching to the choir. That means that uh, people that are joining these games are already part of the uh, what we call the peace camp. Like the, the uh, they they already, they want to interact. They, they will interact with each other anyhow, if we're here or not here. And, and that wasn't our our original cause. We wanted to use video games to to interact people who won't interact in, in the real world uh, without without the video game. Uh, so we decided to build a school program. And and, uh, and and the fact that we use the educational system in Israel for it is that if your school uh, joined this program, you have, as a, as a student, you have to participate in the program. And it doesn't matter what you think of the other side. We, we called this program a play to talk. And we started meeting with principals in different uh, Arab locations and Jewish locations. Eventually, we found, we found two schools. Um, and, uh, and we built a seven weeks program in which students start by learning Minecraft and afterwards they play in couples, but the couples are one from each side. Just, just to explain a bit, the, the program happens simultaneously in an Arab school and in a Jewish school. And the, the people you interact with are always from the other side. You can't play only in one side. What we did, we, we created two groups eventually, a red group and a blue group, and uh, and the, the, the students connected a lot more to the blue or to the color and the missions they had to do in the game 
then to the uh, geographical location and their language. And after we had six uh, uh, virtual meetings, we had a face-to-face -face meeting. And, uh, uh, and in this face-to-face -face meeting, we really understood the impact uh, we did because students weren't afraid of each other. They already knew the, the, the students from the other school. They were just curious how they look. They were curious who, who helped them at their adventure. And, and, and instead of having those awkward moments when you meet people you don't know, they didn't have it. They just met and started to play with each other uh, as their friends for, for months already. Um, our first pilot was in two schools, one in, in, uh, in Nazareth and the second in a city called Rishon Lezion, and, and it was very, very successful. We also uh, handed questionnaires uh, uh, and everybody really liked it. Uh, what, we, what we learned is, uh, from this, this first program was that uh, it was so successful that this, those two schools has, uh, have created a, a long-lasting relationship between the schools. They started meeting on, on a yearly basis, uh, and, uh, and 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 I, I, until now they're, they're still in connections. Students have connected with each other in social media, and 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 it's it's something important because when you're a a, a, a Jewish school to speak Hebrew, you don't see Arab on your feed, and if you're an Arab student in Israel, you won't see Hebrew at your feed. And now those two, those people have friends in social media that are not speaking their, their language, which is, which is amazing. <clears throat> and I just want to show you how the program looks so you understand a bit more. Thanks to the project Play to Talk, Arab and Jewish school children who are separated into different educational systems in Israel can change their perceptions of one another. The focus is on reducing prejudices through positive interaction, since negative stereotypic beliefs about the other are still on the present. Play to Talk uses a platform that children immediately feel comfortable with, that of the popular video game Minecraft. In the project, children from a pair of Jewish and Arab schools meet on a weekly basis to play Minecraft together from their school's computer rooms. Rather than having one school play against the other, the children are divided into two teams, each mixed between the two schools. The children are presented with a set of challenges that require increasing levels of cooperation and collaboration. To overcome the language barrier, Minecraft's chat system is equipped with an automatic online translation service. Throughout the program, the virtual world is supplemented by face-to-face -face meetings where the children discover the real people behind the avatars. The virtual and real-life experiences have a lasting effect. <laughs> Pupils not only overcome stereotypes, many of them also add their counterparts to their social media circles and stay in touch. So there is a persistent change in attitudes towards the other group among children who completed the project. A remarkable achievement that can promote intercultural dialogue and understanding. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so right after the first pilot we did, uh, we presented this pilot in a, in a, in, in a, a convention called Build Peace. Uh, I presented it in, 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 in at that time at Skype. I really didn't see anybody, but a few weeks after it, uh, we got connected, we got contacted by one of the attendees, and he wanted to uh, import this program into um, uh, Georgia, Georgia. Uh, it, it appears in, in Georgia they had a, a problem very different from Israel, but uh, with, with a, a Part of the state that's called of Khazia, uh, and uh, with the, the support of the United uh, with, uh, of European uh, EU, um, we we brought the program to to Georgia and basically uh, duplicated it uh, and and started uh, and did the weekends and did the course in schools uh, in uh, in Georgia. 
uh, which was very, very fun and, and bizarre, at least for me. Uh, uh, other than uh, expanding to, into other places, we mostly focused on expanding our program in Israel. Um, we started charging schools in order to turn uh, charging money uh, from schools uh, in order to turn the NGO into something that's substantial, that is sustainable um, without uh, uh, donations. And, and we grew and grew and grew until uh, in 2018 and 2019, we, we did more than, we did about 20 programs in each year, uh, which was great. Um, we also did a, 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 a academic research uh, finding that there's a really, a, a really big impact on, on students and it has significant long lasting uh, effect uh, on participants. Uh, this research, by the way, we did it in 2017, but uh, it was published just last year. Um, if you if you go to our website, you can just download it and, and read it. Uh, and, and and the fact that we had a, 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 a kind of a, an academic authority telling us that our program really works, it really changes uh, the perception of children. What uh, was was really amazing because before that the only thing we had was our hunch, and uh, having it backed up with an academic research was was really nice. Um, another thing that happened, uh, I think at the beginning of 2018, we we were awarded a, a prize called Intellectual Innovation Award, uh, but by, by the United Nations. Also, uh, it, it was very nice to being uh, awarded uh, or being recognized. By someone outside of the of Israel and, and, and our actions here. In our first five years, we uh, we, we were active in around uh, 50 schools with with more than a, a, a 1,500 students, also affecting a few hundred uh, adults, teachers, principals uh, that were involved in in the program. Uh, it's 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 not a lot. It's still like a drop in the sea. Uh, but but from how we see it, every uh, one child that you you change his perspective is, is someone that can eventually grow up and uh, and live a better life here. And um, so 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 that's the, that's what we did in, in the first five years. And then uh, or anyhow, even even in those five years, a, a program like ours is something with lots of problems. You can call them challenges. I call them here challenges, but but they're problems. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had was in a in a school called Shevach Mofet, in a school in Tel Aviv. What happened there is the the this specific school has like very smart people, but uh, but I don't know how to how to say it exactly. But uh, they were very naughty. Uh, one of the uh, children. Um, Hacked that our hacked our system and started giving all the Jewish children um, more powers, like they can fly and, and swords and, and shields and stuff like that. And and what they started to do is just um, uh, you know hit or, or uh, and the the Arab students they didn't respond basically to our program. And this was one of the of the programs that eventually didn't have a face to face meeting at all. Uh, so some of our programs weren't successful, like this, like this one, um, and of course there's always other challenges, like technical challenges, uh, synchronizing the the Jewish and the and the Arab schools with all the holidays and all the problems. Uh, we had, for example, one time. Uh, never mind. I, I don't have. A, I don't think I have time for another story. Uh, but there's, there's always problems, and, and from those problems, we, we learned a lot and eventually created, a, I'm not sure like a bulletproof, but uh, definitely an improved program, uh, something that, that allows us to, to duplicate it faster and, and with less problems as we go. Uh, our biggest problem happened at the, at the beginning of uh, 2019. Uh, where the program was basically so big that we had to stop all our activities. What happened is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Microsoft launched 
Microsoft Education and the Ministry of Education in Israel uh, um, basically told us we can't use the original Minecraft version anymore. Uh, we understood it a bit too late and it took us more, uh, about six months to completely build our program uh, from scratch on a new platform on Minecraft Education, uh, which is a completely different set of code. It looks the same, but from from our perspective, it was a lot of work to, to basically reboot the whole program, and that's what we did. Um, now our program looks a lot better. You can see it here. I have another video. So, so this is like, like what our new program looks like. It, it can seem uh, closer, but there's lots of more content. Like, for example, at the beginning, you saw there's a maze and someone needed to guide someone through that maze, another student from another uh, geographical lo location. Um, we launched it at the beginning of, of 2020. And of course, because of, of uh, the coronavirus, uh, we had to stop the pilot uh, because of the lockdowns. Uh, but instead of completely stopping it, what we did, we we created a, a, a distance learning version of play to talk We call it play to talk Home Edition. And using that version, we, we finished our, our first pilot. Uh, and uh, that means we had one face-to-face -face meeting before the coronavirus. And when we wanted to do the second face-to-face uh, face -face meeting in our new program, we have two. Uh, it was already, it was done with, with Zoom. Uh, or, or yeah, it was, it was done with with Zoom. Uh, we also during the coronavirus uh, lockdowns periods, we, we launched a, an esport training program in order to create a mixed uh, esport team. This is uh, um, for more for older uh, kids, not from the same age group that uh, Play to Talk is used. Uh, also, something that can be done from uh, from uh, home and, and not not in schools. Uh, in Israel, I don't know if you know it, but we had, I think, the most uh, number of days that schools weren't active because of the, of the coronavirus. We had three lockdowns, and, and because of that, uh, we weren't able to get uh, uh, attention from schools, from school principals, from districts. They, were, they didn't know even if they're starting to, to teach. Uh, um, happily, uh, we hope this is this is uh, going to change. Um, so, although the first pilot was very successful in our opinion, uh, we haven't operated a single program since then. So that means like a year, a whole year, there were no programs in Games for Peace. We already have two programs scheduled after Passover, which is about three weeks from now. Uh, so, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, be back in action. Uh, very, very soon and continue to influence uh, young children in Israel and reduce prejudice between them. Uh, so that's basically our story in 25 minutes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope 
it can inspire you and of course I'm, I'm here to answer any questions or have a discussion yeah, with you um, so Jack Judy, thank you so yeah. much for, for, for keeping to the time. Uh, I know we discussed 25 minutes, minutes on the button just before we started the webinar. So I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for sharing such a, an interesting sort of journey um, for Games for Peace. Um, to our audience, this is now your time to shine. So we're now gonna open up to questions. A couple of notes about our format for those of you who are unfamiliar or new to the Thursday Talks. You could submit a question in two ways. The first is through the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, which will allow you to type your question. The second is to click on the hand icon. The hand icon on your GoToWebinar dashboard will allow us to unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question live. When you do submit your question, we ask that you submit your name and affiliation. And just a note, these talks are recorded and posted on Deem for Pieces Media Gallery, so those who are not able to join us at this time can go back and listen to the presentation and the discussion. I'm going to get us underway, Judy, because I have actually quite a lot of questions uh, about s some of the things you raised. Um, so obviously, you, you chose Minecraft for a reason. Um, it's popular. It's um, hard to start your own platform or start your own game and get people integrated. So by utilizing an existing platform, an existing game that people are playing, um, it, it obviously allows you to sort of tap into like a multiplier effect in a way. So I, I'm curious, did you look at any other games or was Minecraft kind of just like an obvious fit for, for what you were trying to do um, with Games for Peace? Uh, okay, yeah. First of all, we did look at a lot of other games. We also tried a few games. Uh, we had uh, uh, games in, in Team Fortress, which is a shooting game. It's a bit strange, you know, Arabs and Jews shooting at each other, but they're playing, which, is, which was great anyhow. Uh, and uh, and I showed another game that we used, which is uh, Dota, uh, Dota 2, which we use for the esports. Uh, I'm sure that if we launched Game for Peace today, uh, we wouldn't have picked only Minecraft. We probably would have picked also uh, uh, Roblox or Fortnite, which both have a, a very open environment today uh, that allows you to to uh, create the types of interactions we're trying to create between uh, between students uh, but at that time Fortnite, uh, 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 Minecraft was super popular it's still super popular and the fact that students are basically fighting uh, to enter our classes is 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 an indication that our, our choice was right so one other question do I have is that you mentioned uh that the sort of students uh, uh, from arab schools and from sort of jewish schools were coming together after sort of meeting each other online um have you ever like been able to have you ever done this with with no in-person element like obviously you want to make sure that what the the kids are learning in the game is, is translating to online um but have you ever been able to sort of just run an online program and measure sort of uh the kids engagement afterwards without actually creating an environment for them to meet in person um like does it always have to be supplemented by an online by an in-person event uh, what happens after our program uh, is is not in our control what we do in the program itself is is very moderated uh, like the, the 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 interactions we plan in the virtual world are, are moderated by us even in the face-to-face -face meetings, we we bring moderators to to create games to to, to you know we organize social games uh, between the kids. Uh, but the minute the program uh, ends, it, the kids do whatever they want, and and we know because they tell us that they they keep interacting with each other, uh, or through schools, like I mentioned, or through social networks without any relation to the school. So uh, that's one of the that's one of the ways we know that we, we did something we really changed something in how they perceive each other because it it would have never happened uh, specifically in Israel uh, between Arabs and Jewish people and Jewish kids uh, because they just don't interact with each other usually on uh, on, daily, on on regular basis. Yeah, and maybe I was un unclear, but Marla Slavner. Uh, from the Global Sunrise Project, it has probably put this um, 
question better than I did. And, and has the experience for the students led to further peace advocacy efforts? Like, ha have you tracked the engagement of your first students, you know, seven years ago and saw okay, what they went so, on to become or? Um... So, so one thing, first of all, our NGO is called Games for Peace, but we're not advocating uh, actively for peace. We just want a, a youth or kids to interact uh, in order to sh in order to allow them to, to to eventually talk with each other. We're, we're not advocating for peace in our programs, although the name of the NGO is Games for Peace. Uh, for the second uh, question, uh, or, or for, for the question itself, sorry, uh, we don't we have like a, a alumni program we have a facebook group of all the alumni but we're not tracking them uh, in an like an orderly basis uh, we did that in the research in the academic research we did we we brought questionnaires like six months afterwards afterwards and, and stuff like that or the researcher did that uh, but we we don't really track uh, each student uh, so, so, I, so, so that's the answer. We don't. Yeah, I, I think that's obviously an area that could be that we we struggle with in the peace building field generally. I know you're not in the peace building field, but you know how how could it's it we we want to track our change over time, and often our change that we're tracking is confined to the twenty month twenty one month project period with the contract that we signed with the donor. Um, so, so I think that's obviously a, an area that could be really interesting to see. You know. One, it's you can see the immediate positive effects of this this creating this interaction uh, and this connection and communication. Um, but what are the long term effects? And I think that could be could be something interesting to look into in the future. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. It, we did wanted to to or started to develop a, like a, a second program that will run a year after that people can. Uh, we wanted to focus it mostly on, on uh, creating content together, like uh, broadcasting, how people play together and stuff like that. But we, we never got to it uh, yet. Great. So our next question comes from Colonel Pratt. And Colonel writes, what kind of comments have you gotten from parents, from the parents of your participants um, who might think that gamification in the school setting isn't always uh, seen as a legitimate format of learning. So, you know, some parents probably look at this and think their kids are just playing video games. So what what would you respond to parents who say that? Or have, have you had that experience of, you know, parents or teachers saying that to you? Uh, we haven't, I hadn't had this experience, by the way, uh, having, uh, you know, when you, when 95% of your curriculum is uh, is books and and, and lectures and, and uh, you know regular uh, education and you have like an hour in the week that you you use a video game to interact with other people, I, I didn't hear any parents complaining about it. Um, so and I, I don't think I don't think people perceive video games. As as something in education, as something that that is harmful uh, in any way. But that's that's my opinion. And I didn't hear anything from the parents. It, we did have a lot of, of interesting story hearing uh, hearing how uh, children that that did our program interact with their parents because most of the of, of the of the prejudice. Uh, between about a uh, Jewish in the Arab community and vice versa are coming from the parents. So when you are, for example, hospitalized and you 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 uh, you're sleeping in a bed near someone that is different from you, and and you hear your parents talking, and and that's what we got from from students that did the program, and and students tell us that they they fix their uh, their parents' mistake, like a parent saying oh i don't want to sleep like uh, near on the same room with with this guy and and the kid tells him why not he's exactly the same so so we did have experiences like that with parents but uh, concerning the question i i never heard anyone complaining about uh, yeah that's that's that is a fascinating insight the idea that kids correcting their parents and um uh, I, I love to hear stories like that. That's that's exactly kind of what you want to see from a program like this. You know, the the challenges of behavior, challenges of uh, sort of 
uh, legacy perspectives that that tend to be dominant um having them challenged by by your child is 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 something remarkable um, yeah so so Judy, one question we have and you spoke about your example in georgia um but like have you tried um applying games for peace to other contexts have you looked at um, doing it in other countries, or are you firmly focused uh, on sticking with uh, Israel at the moment? Okay, our first uh, concept was not doing it uh, solely in Israel, but doing it between Israel and Palestine. Uh, but it weren't accepted uh, in Palestine in the way we thought it would be. Uh, so, so we did operate Games for Peace in Israel in different uh, cultures or in cultures that have uh, uh, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm missing a word, like uh, racist opinions about each other. Okay, for example, we did a program between uh, two parts of Jerusalem, uh, both Arabs, but they're very um, in, in constant conflict between each other. We did uh, programs between Druze and Jews. We did programs between Bedouins and Arabs. Uh, so so the, because Israel is so... Uh, had so many cultures, uh, we did try it in, in, different, um, in different locations or different types of, 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 um, um, of problems like, like these. Uh, now we're, we're looking at uh, doing programs, uh, for example, with handicapped children and regular children, again, for the same reason, to, to decrease uh, the prejudices. Uh, uh, and uh, and we also started to to uh, work on a on a, a program in Kosovo uh, with the UN, which I think currently also stopped because of the of the coronavirus. Uh, what we did here is ba basically can be duplicated very easily, and that's that's an advantage of having an, an online program. Uh, we already built it, we already researched it, we know it works, so it can just be moved into other places in the world that have the same problems uh, and, and uh, hopefully it will work there as well. But, but our right. experience outside of Israel was all, only uh, Georgia and Abkhazia. Okay. Uh, well, look, there's, there's tremendous opportunity there. And uh, I think one of the most important things is like understanding how to, to meet your audience where they are. Um, too often we, we go back to traditional and archaic views of, of teaching uh, and recognizing, you know, how to, to communicate a message effectively is not just, you know, lecturing someone. It could be, you know, working with a digital influencer, working with a video game. So it's like you have that sort of veiled learning. Um, it's not sort of deliberate in your face, but it's it's a, it's as if not more impactful. Um, I had a call this morning with our influencers for change uh, through the Connexus platform. And it was fascinating to hear their perspectives on how sort of they're able to, to shape um, perspectives of young people in their community and some of their um, approaches to doing that. It's uh, it's really important that we we cater our messages to, to the audience we're working with and um, making sure that we're we're using engaging formats. And I think uh, using Minecraft uh, is is very innovative innovative in that regard and, and could obviously be scaled to many other contexts around the world. Um, so we're, we're at 40 minutes past the hour. So I'm going to give the audience uh, one last sort of opportunity to ask questions. If you do want to ask the final question of today, you can click on the hand icon to raise your hand. If not, um, we, will, we will wrap things up. Um, I'll give it 10 seconds. I wish I had a countdown clock that I could put on everyone's screen and um, some theme music, but unfortunately not. Um, Okay, so let's 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 wrap this up. Um, Duty, I, I I just want to thank you for uh, sharing your your really innovative and amazing work um, today. There's a lot that I'm taking away from this, working out how we can sort of potentially integrate games into sort of reaching out to some communities, um, particularly around combating misinformation. Um, you've got the cogs in my brain turning, um, and that is all I ever want from from one of these webinars. So uh, I really appreciate that and. Uh, a big thank you to our audience for, for your questions and for your engagement and continued support of Deeming for Peace. Uh, this recording is going to be posted online on our media gallery in the next couple of days. So please feel free to return to it and share it with your colleagues. 
Uh, there is a discussion section on, on Connexus where we can discuss this. There's also a comment section under the recording. Feel free to continue this discussion in the comments. And uh, yeah, we'll be back with a, another Thursday talk in the next couple of weeks. Um, so thanks again to everyone. Um, look out for each other, take care, stay healthy. We're, we're on the mend, we're on the other side. And uh, I look forward to talking to you all again in the not too distant future. Thanks again, Duty. Thank you, Jack, for having me.